Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's Friday, and we're going to be talking about big, giant robots, <laughs> just like Whee! this one, except for not this one. <laughs> also joining us, Perry Nemiroff. You know what else we're not talking about today? Transformers. But Woo! we're talking about better robots. Don't tell Roca. <laughs> Sorry, the man who loves his Transformers, right. John Roca. Mm, that's right. You know what else we're not talking about? Jurassic Park, one of the most overrated Spielberg films. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a chock full of we're his Boston accent, <laughs> Mark Ellis is Don't joining us. Don't forget that John Stephen Roca enjoys Independence Day 2 resurgence. Don't listen to a word he says. Go for your movie. <laughs> All right, My what do we got love first? That movie. Okay, John Boyega recently offered up our first look at his character Jake in Pacific Rim Uprising, and now we've got a look at the redesigns for the new and improved Jaegers from the movie. Boyega plays Jake Pentecost, the next generation of badass kaiju fighting humans who are charged with protecting the human race. Uprising is currently filming and will hit theaters on February 23rd, 2018. Dennis, thoughts on the look of the Jaegers from Pacific Rim Uprising? Okay, seeing these concept art pictures, look, it's it's not actually <laughs> still from from the movie, <laughs> but it makes me super excited for the film just because when the movie came out and it didn't do so well here domestically, I was like, okay, this is over. Love the film. We're never going to see another one. But because it did so well in international <laughs> markets, it actually got greenlit for a sequel. Look, I, I wish uh, Guillermo del Toro came back to direct it. However, Stephen DeKnight, I think, is another good choice. Loved his work on Spartacus. He also did Daredevil Season 1. He's directed a few episodes of television like Dollhouse, Daredevil. This is going to be his first major motion picture, and I'm excited to see what ha what he does with it. However, on the other hand, looking at these this concept art, I get a little apprehensive because of the design, the design looks more sleeker. It looks more closer to some of the more Japanese a anime designs where, mm. like some people mentioned it looked like Giver. Some people look like it, said it looks like Neo Neon Genesis Evangel... I don't know how to Evangeline. pronounce it. Evangeline. Yeah. Evangeline. Evangeline. Yeah. Neon. Like that. I don't want them to be moving around like the Transformers. Like one of the gr the good things that I like about Pacific Rim <laughs> is that you get a, so a sense of the scale, mm -hmm. the size, and the weight of these giant robots instead of Transformers where they're just like spinning around like crazy yeah. because the, the, it doesn't have like obey the laws of physics. Sure. So that's my concern. Roka, I know you're super excited for Pacific totally Rim am. Uprising. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this concept? I right? love that Dennis's kid brother got a drawing kit in the mail and made these. This is so oh. amazing. <laughs> I mean, no, no, honestly, no. These are great designs. I actually like that they're sleeker. Um, I don't know what you can take from this, because like Dennis said, it's not a still from the actual set. So we don't know if this is what they're going to essentially end up looking like. But it is interesting, and I dig this, the designs. The designs of the kaiju were never a problem with the film. It's the story and some of the script issues. Like, that was really story. the problem with the film all around from beginning to end. Just nutty, nutty stuff that made no sense. And so for me, that's, that's the thing that I worry about. But... Having what you said, Dennis, Stephen DeKnight on this project gives me hope. I'm definitely going to go see it just to see if he can bring that kind of a grittier, harder edge to it. And listen, no one wants to say this, but Del Toro, I don't know. Like, I, I know he was great starting out, but that Crimson Peak was not that great. And a couple of his recent projects haven't really gone off the board, haven't really <laughs> gotten off the ground in terms of reception from the public, right? You can argue quality all day and all night, but if people aren't buying your product at some point, you've got it, that there has to be a, a statute of limitations on your ability to keep making this kind of stuff. So I'm happy that the night is, is coming on to do it. Um, and I like that Kira Snyder is one of the writers. I'm one of these like people in a boat who liked the 100 and she produced and wrote some of the episodes there. No one ever talks about this show. And the 100 is one of these quietly really good shows uh, on network tel on, on on the cable television that no one really talks about. So to me, there's a there's a lot of positive things here, and I do dig the design. It doesn't look transformer-ish to me. It looks more close to what we've seen from the Power Rangers stuff a little bit too. So that seems more. So it kind of leans into what you're saying, the anime kind of vibe to it. Perry, reversing back to Mr. GDT. <laughs> He is getting the opportunity Ooh, to love, make a way. second Pacific Rim movie. So even though it didn't crush it at the domestic box mm -hmm. office, it certainly made enough overall to warrant a sequel. 
Mm -hmm. got Troll Hunters on Netflix, which I, I haven't watched it, but I hear it's fantastic. He's mm -hmm. got a whole nother season. I think it was picked up for another season mm -hmm. already. That guy is fine. He's making quality stuff. He's taking risks, and he's getting opportunities to make more. So there's no knocking GDT in this conversation. <laughs> this, though... I, I don't really, I'm really excited for Pacific Rim. I love the first mm -hmm. movie. I had so much fun with it, and I really did want a second one. I'm happy we're getting it. I'm not ready to judge the new Jaegers based on this image that came from a licensing website, which in those kind, I don't know what specifically this image was drawn up to achieve, but those types of things are not typically done using finished stills from a movie. And they're, they're often, it's like, this looks like a, like a packaging to sell a toy or something that that's not the way to judge what it's going to look like in the final feature i i hope they're not too sleek and clean looking because that was part of the fun of the first movie and also with the toys that they sold after i mean the detail on those things are incredible this to me looks like the fisher price version of what i saw from the first movie but again this is from a licensing website it's too early to judge i don't think this is going to be a good representation of what they're going to look like in the final cut i was going to say perry and roki you guys are getting a lot from this picture man yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a picture where the eggers look a little more athletic which is a necessary thing it's the new generation okay so you watch the first pacific rim now look did the eggers come out victorious i won't ruin the movie regardless of how that film ends up you watch some game film and you see how much more nimble the kaiju are than the Jaegers. so you have to do some retooling you got to make them a little more fast a little more fears they're not going to be transformers level because i agree with you dennis i like that they are big lumbering machines and they can't transform in the way that optimus prime can but you have to make them a little bit quicker if they're going to be tangling with the next generation of kaija so i think this is a cool look yeah i i think we can't judge too much on this because we, we we are still waiting for the stills but i just i, I am a little concerned that that hopefully it doesn't go that way with the transformers uh style let's let's cross our fingers man because we got transformers movies coming yeah, yeah. There, there's no stopping transformers Damn right there we isn't. want pacific rim which is kind of right. different roke is still watching that trailer from from last week I, right? i'll put it on right now i'm yeah. about to come back on this guillermo del toro thing but i mean we, we can't get into because we have a lot of stories but if you hey, look at the box crimson office, teak more like crimson valley Mojo, am i right yeah, <laughs> there we go i mean there we go. go to box office mojo one of perry's favorite websites and take a look at his last five films and you tell me see i'm in love with the guy's imagination yes though. absolutely it's not necessarily any and he's not behind the lens here. So no. if he's contributing ideas, I right. got like Steven tonight molding those ideas. We get those ass kickers. Yeah. It's going to be an awesome movie. All right. All right. What's next? Thanks to an announcement from John Carpenter on his Facebook page, David Gordon Green has come on board to direct a rebooted Halloween for Miramax Pictures with a release date now set for October 19th, 2018. Gordon Green, whose credits include Stronger, Our Brand is Crisis, and Pineapple Express, is teaming with Danny McBride to write the script. Carpenter will executive produce with Malik Akkad and Jason Blum for Blumhouse Pictures. In Carpenter's announcement on Facebook, he said, David and Danny both came to my office recently with Jason Blum and shared their vision for the new movie and wow, they get it. I think you're going to dig it. They blew me away, Carpenter wrote. I might even do the music. Maybe. It could be kind of cool. And you'll get to see it in theaters on October 19th, 2018. Perry, how do you feel about the new creative team for the Halloween reboot? I hope I can form a coherent thought about this because I, <laughs> I still don't really know how to process it. If you made me place a bet on who is going to be directing the <laughs> Halloween movie, I think the last person on my list would have been David Gordon Green. And not because I don't think he's a good director, but because... I mean, he is predominantly known for his comedy work, yeah. especially his comedy work with Danny McBride. The last thing the two of them did together was Vice Principals, and no one would compare Vice Principals to Michael Myers, so I'm a little shocked we're in this position. Since digesting the original announcement, though, I don't know, I'm thinking back to movie movies like Joe with uh, Nick Cage and uh, Ty Sheridan, and that, that was a pretty dark, creepy movie, and they're both just talented Film, filmmakers in general. So uh, what, like, why shouldn't I give them the benefit of the doubt? And especially if this statement is true and not just meant to build hype, that they walked into that office and, and they're fans and they just got it. I mean, who's to say? Uh, actually, perfect example, look at Get Out. 
Would you ever think that Jordan Peele would direct a really great, creepy horror movie? Probably not, but that's what he's doing right now. Maybe they're taking, maybe Blumhouse is taking a cue from the success of that movie and they're thinking, oh, you know, let's continue this trend and make it a thing. And I don't know, for all we know, maybe this is part of the key to finally making a fresh horror sequel reboot, whatever you want to call them. Because they're clearly not working as is, so maybe a different take on it is what we need. I, I think I'm open to it. Mark? Uh, Dennis, it's about time my comedy brothers and sisters got the credit they deserve for being able to get into the mind of a serial killer so easily. David Gordon Green is somebody who, it, like, when you look at where the Marvel films have gone, maybe DC will go, is they've been cherry-picking a lot of writers that primarily got their start in comedy. So you can understand that, and you can translate that to a different type of genre, even something like horror. So I echo Perry's sentiments where I say, if I had to place a bet on who was going to be directing the new Halloween movie, it would totally not be these guys. And now I feel like that guy in Vegas who doesn't have a whole lot to lose. I've blown most of my wad, so I got 40 bucks left. Let's put it on this team and see what they can do for Halloween because if nothing else, they have passion. And if that resonates with a guy like John Carpenter, who these quotes make me elevate over like a level of James Cameron when he pretended to be excited about Terminator Jenny Smith, but it really just seemed like lift service. This seems like John Carpenter is excited about this team. When he says he might even come back and do the music, that means that John Carpenter likes the way this direction is going. So I'm excited now. Yeah, for me, as someone who isn't a horror fan, this actually intrigues me more because you have John Carper who created and directed the original film saying all these great things, saying that these guys get it, that he was blown away by their pitch, and that he might do the music as well. And then David Gordon Green is a director that I like. He is mostly known for his comedy, but I saw his film Snow Angels, which is mm. a serious yeah, drama. A yeah, yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. movie, yeah. underrated that most people didn't see. Yeah. So he definitely has some range. And then I think maybe this film is another area that he wants to go into. Roka? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, here's the thing. It's it's unusual, but this is what you do with this property. It seems like the Rob Zombie thing, was, which was a terrible, oh, terrible man. thing, right? Horrible. But they were trying to do something different with it. And this, for whatever reason, people don't want to just do straight up Halloween, which drives me nuts because Carpenter laid the blueprint out. It's a fantastic property, fantastic franchise. One of the best, if not the number one horror uh, person ever. And so, for so many reasons, you know, for so many reasons. And, and so, it bothers me that they're going in this direction a little bit. Because this is going to be tongue-in-cheek. There's going to be humor. There's going to be uncomfortable no, no, situations. No, not necessarily. They the said, <clears throat> well, if, if you want to take the quote straightforward as From, in him not being sarcastic, Danny McBride said, David and I are thrilled to step outside of our comedic collaborations and yeah. dive into a dark and vicious horror. Nobody will be laughing. Yeah, I, I think Danny McBride's going to be throwing a lot of yucks in the new Alien movie either. So, you we'll know, see. I, I, I think people say that kind of stuff to appease the fans. And then, like, as the script goes along, here's but because if you're a comic, it's really, you know, it's really hard to turn that off. You know, in, in, I can in, never turn off. The funny, <laughs> the, the funny faucet in is always in running. Comics. The funny but, look, but look, I think they deserve a benefit of the doubt, like you were saying, Perry, in, say, in reanalyzing this news like. Do we give them a chance? Sure. Uh, they, they've created content that people like, people have gone to. So let's see what they do. I would be surprised if there's not jokes in this, but yeah. maybe they'll have the, 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 they'll have the proper amount of reverence for the property that you need to have to bring this back. I mean, Michael, you got to, in, in, to not lose, I mean, not to use a, a cliche, but you got to resuscitate him in the right way. Yeah, I, I don't think, like, <clears throat> they're going to go full comedy. Mm -hmm. Look, if there's, like, little jokes here and there with their kind of co comedic tone, right. I have no problem with that, as long as the fil film itself isn't a well, if, comedy. Well, if you want to see that done well, go see Get Out on February 24th. Yeah. It's a great example yeah. of how to use comedy and horror, but... Back to what you said before, it yeah. is a real thing at this stage in the process, the idea of them wanting to appease the fans and get people yeah. talking because these are two pretty big familiar names. I imagine they could have walked into their office and the folks in charge thought, well, th this could be the best we could get so how can we say no to them? I would hope that I don't part. Think so. I would hope yeah. that part of that package would be the fact that they really did come with a strong, yeah. good concept. I think they came to play ball that yeah. day. I don't think they involved a lot of banana peels in their script, <laughs> yeah. and I think it's going to be a really scary horror movie. But what I would be up for is the ending, like Pineapple Express, where they're all sitting oh. in the diner <laughs> talking about the night that just went on. Like, dude, we, this guy almost killed us. And we're almost dead. It's really funny. Yeah. All right, guys, we're moving on to buy or sell. Natasha, what do we got first? 
Yesterday, Kevin Smith took to his Facebook page to offer up an update on his Ask or View Askew universe. While there was some movement on a Clerks 3 and Mallrats 2, it appears now those projects are no longer moving forward. One project that is moving forward, however, is a sequel to Jay and Silent Bob Stripe strike back. Smith revealed on Facebook that last month he began writing a script entitled Jay and Silent Bob Reboot. And so all last month I had the time of my life laughing while writing Jay and Silent Bob Reboot, a fun flick in which the Jersey boys have to go back to Hollywood to stop a brand new reboot of the old Bluntman and Chronic movie they hated so much. It's a tongue-in-cheek silly-ass satire that pokes fun at the movie business's recent redo obsession, featuring an all-star cast of cameos and familiar faces. And I already met with the good folks at Miramax and they're into it. So I'm hoping we'll be shooting in the summer. Mark, buy or sell Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Uh, I buy this so hard and I wouldn't have bought it if I didn't hear the premise. But the way that Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back had such a great time skewing everything that was going on in Hollywood at that time with all of the reboots and remakes that we have now, this is the perfect time for these guys to come back to Hollywood and give it a kick in the ass. I like this way over the idea of a Clerks 3 or a Mallrats 2. I think this is the right property for them to keep doing, and I'm really up for it. Perry? Yeah, I, I think I'm open to this, and I'm definitely more into this idea than the other things he was working on. And mm. the good thing is this is a property he's got the <laughs> rights to, so I imagine this isn't just talk that's never going to pan out. Yeah. He really has the power to shoot this thing when he says he's going to and I mean I, I love industry uh, jokes and parody and all that stuff so I, I'm I think I'm into this and they're in shape too I mean when when they yeah, do their live things. podcast Jay and Simon Bob get old they clearly still have that chemistry they're working in front of live audiences a lot these days so they are they're a package deal that's ready to get back in front of the big screen in my opinion yeah I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> buy this as well I actually was looking forward to Clerks 3 and uh, the Mallrats Two, which eventually turned into a TV series pitch. Um, I, 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 I like the original one. I, they did a satire in that as well. Mm. Favorite part was that Goodwill Hunting yeah. Part Two <laughs> with Ben Affleck and Matt Damon in there. And I think it, they also poked fun at the rabid kind of fanboy. Mm -hmm. And and that was kind of in the infancy of the internet, you know, craze. Now it's how many years later. Now it's even times a hundred. Mm. So I'm looking forward to Kevin Smith kind of making fun of that. It's, okay. inter it's interesting. I mean, my initial reaction was it's not the early, it's not the late 90s, early 2000s anymore. We should move on from these characters. But, you know, when you take a look, do a little more research, and you see the fact that they have been doing this stuff on stage and live, they're honing this act. They've been honing this comedy. They're not just like picking up after 12 years later and sitting down and trying to write a script. So there is something that could come out of this. And I do think Kevin does his best work in this structure. Like we've seen recently with his films, they haven't really hit it out of the park in the box office and quality sometimes you can argue as well on those. So for me, if he's coming back to something that he really loves to do and he, he has shown that he can be on point like he was with the Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back movie, then great. If this is dogma, we're in trouble. And, and if this is something like Yoga Hosers or what he was trying, like we're in some trouble trouble and that's what I worry about with him or cop out but I think he's in control here and I think he has a, a chance to really create something fun so I, I buy I tentatively buy it for now but my worry is that these characters are the long in the tooth and I wonder how much their satire they're, they might become victims of satire themselves. Well, I guarantee you know you, they're going to be making fun of that in the first minute of okay. this movie. Mm -hmm. is that they're going to lampoon themselves as yeah. much as anybody else, and you'll probably see that in the marketing material as well. I think this could this is very ripe ground right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, with the Clerks 3 thing, though, <laughs> I, I wonder two things. One, who was the, the member of, of oh, the yeah. original crew that didn't want to come back? <laughs> and two, is this the loophole? Remember when he was going to retire after yeah. he did Clerks 3? Is this the loophole now? Because I never <laughs> believed he was going to retire, just like I don't believe Tarantino is ever going to mm. retire. Is this the loophole now? Because he said, after Clerks 3, that then I'm done. Mm -hmm. Well, if he never does Clerks 3, yeah. now he can just keep, keep on going. Do you think there's a Chasing Amy sequel? That's actually my favorite that's what, that's Kevin, my favorite Kevin, Smith, Kevin yeah. Smith movie. That's right. And everyone's talking about Mallrats or Clerks. I'm like, what about Chasing Amy? Yeah, I mean, that Affleck was... might be available. We don't know. <laughs> oh, as man. long as he steers clear of doing any more, like, midnight lineup fare, fine by me. Yeah. I still have nightmares about Tusk and not, like, the good Ooh, horror Tusk, movie yeah. kind of nightmares. Ugh. That, yeah. I that was dug hand... Tusk. Oh. Just don't make Cop <gasps> Out again. Just don't make Re Cop you Out You really, yeah, you dug Tusk? Yeah. Well, I can at least appreciate the effort. Oh. Red State was good. Red State, if you if you understand the satire behind Red State, that was a good movie. Yeah. I like Dogma too. Like I'm a Kevin. I like Dogma man. too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I was going duh the whole time during Dogma. Duh. 
duh. Well, man, you just didn't see anything day, new. I'm going to be as smart as you, and I'm going to get the judge film the same way. I'm not saying that. I'm All not right, saying what's that. next? Okay. We recently learned that producer Adi Shankar has been working on an animated adaptation of the Castlevania video game series for Netflix, and now, thanks to a report from Dave Trembor at Collider.com, that might not be the only animated offering Shankar has up his sleeve. The producer shared an update on a possible Dread sequel, hinting that it's going to happen one way or another, even if it's not live action. If anyone is still wondering, there's no update on a Dread sequel, but I'm going to make it happen at some point. It may not be live action, but it's going to happen at some point. There will be more Judge Dread at some point. Dennis, if a Dread sequel does happen, would you buy or sell an animated one? I just don't see it happening. Um, I... I'd buy it just to see it because I checked out the, the animated web series that Eddie Shankar produced, and it's definitely a different tone than Dread, the live action film that we just saw with Carl Urban. It kind of has more of a darker, satirical tone to it while still being very violent. But it almost sounds like from his quotes that it's just more of, we can't get this done, so this is kind of what I'll do instead versus mm -hmm. this is what he actually wants to do. I think if, if, if he got his first choice, he'd make the live action dread sequel. Yeah. So, uh, Broca. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would rather do a live action sequel myself personally, but there might be something to explore here. If they did an animated series, they could go dark. They could play like justice. If you've seen justice league dark, even properties like DC can go really dark. So why not have something like judge dread where you don't have any limits and you can animate it as you see fit and really, uh, bring to life the atmosphere and the vibe of those uh, dread comics. And so for me, I, I would be open to that. I personally love that movie so damn much. And the fact that like what, uh, what, uh, Carl Urban, says 750,000 copies of that film were, were bought in the first week of its release on DVD. That tells you that it has an audience, that people loved it, and that he was probably right, that it was marketed incorrectly. But the people that went to see it, especially in 3D, it was fantastic. And so, it, to me, I consider it one of the top 20, top 15 superhero films ever, technically a superhero film with Judge Dredd. Um, so, to me, I'm happy that they're, this is even in the conversation, that they're going to have some version of this. You know, Dennis, I watched Dredd, and I just said, duh, the whole time. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was pretty late out there. Did you know? I, so, I, that's the Stallone one, I think you're thinking the about. The Stallone and the Rob Schneider one is an all-time classic. I have the poster in my <laughs> office. As far as the new Dredd, I didn't get on board as much as everybody else did. I was not a fan of it. Now, maybe I need to just go revisit it and check it out again. That could be on me. Either way, I would buy an animated version of this. I think it'd be fun if you had to do it that way, but mm -hmm. it's clearly the preference, I think, with the fans of Dread is they want to see another live action version. But can we talk about the coolest part of this story is the Castlevania Netflix oh, series. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be monumentally awesome. I'm sure Josh and the rest of the TV talk crew will talk about that as yeah. well. And he also, what was the other thing that, oh, he wants to do another, because he, Eddie Shankar was behind the, the whole Power Rangers yeah. Um, yeah. fan film, the kind of yeah. like R-rated one. I, right. I think that. he's looking to do maybe an animated version of that as well. Wow. Even though he doesn't have the rights yeah, to that. Yeah, I'd be <laughs> curious to see if that'll ever pan uh, Perry, out. Are Probably you, not. Perry, what do you think about this animated Dread film? Ellis, I think you should give Dread another shot because I saw that when they premiered it or uh, whatever level of premiere it was at Comic-Con, whatever year that was, and I didn't like it. And I wrote up a negative review about it. Mm. And if I could go online and erase that from existence, I would because <laughs> since I have watched it again and again and again and again and again, and that's why even though I have absolutely nothing against the idea of an animated Dread movie because I just want more Dread, yeah. I'm so disappointed they're not going to make Dread 2. I want that movie so badly with the with with Carl Urban in it. It it's just how it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of detail in that movie that I missed the first time around disturbs me. Mm -hmm. And it was a midnight screening. I was tired. It was the first <laughs> night of Comic-Con, but no excuses. You should really rewatch it though. Do you know that that we actually held that screening? Did you really? Yeah, that was oh, back when we were with AMC. It was, uh, wow. Yeah. I think that might have been my first Comic-Con ever. It was uh -huh. like 2000 13, right? No. Um, it was in 2010. I was going to say 10. I don't think Dread was. Yeah, I'm going 11. Was. 11 or 12. I can't, I okay. can't remember. Well, no, I think I it's 12. I think it's 12. That's amazing. Yeah, okay. but yeah, yeah. We, we actually held that screening. With, and uh, and Linda Headley's oh, fantastic right. in that. It mm -hmm. came out yeah. 2012. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Glad right. we cleared that up. All right. Uh, now let's hop back to the other 
topic? Yeah, we we're going to rewind, Drunken sidebar, guys. drunken sidebar. <laughs> Taking it back. Okay, THR reports that Deathstroke himself, Joe Manganiello, and Marley Shelton are in negotiations to join Dwayne Johnson in Rampage, New Line's adventure project based on the 1980s video game. Brad Payton is directing the movie, which reunites Johnson, Payton, and producer Bo Flynn, the team behind San Andreas, and Journey to the Mysterious Island. New Line will release the film that will, of course, feature a transformed gorilla, crocodile, and wolf wreaking havoc on North American cities and landmarks. The movie is set for an April 20th, 2018 release. Roca, buy or sell Joe Maginello and Marley Shelton with The Rock in Rampage. I mean, how do you not buy this? It's The Rock and it's Rampage. I'm sure Mark and I remember playing that in Damn, the arcade. Right, we did. I mean, Rampage was awesome so that they're going to turn this into a video. This is this could be ironically the first video game movie that actually is successful. <laughs> so I think this is insane to me. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with this. They got the right people on board. San Andreas, whatever you want to say about San Andreas, it is a fun time in the movie. I think they're tongue in cheek through that whole thing and they do a nice job with that. And I, th I think they'll do the same thing with this. Casting Joe Magani uh, Manganiello is great too because you got you need a guy that's going to match the rock size and presence on screen and Joe has that ability. You know, we see him possibly being Deathstroke so they, they, they certainly have a lot of faith in his energy on screen. Uh, and wh how do you not cast the rock for God's sakes? It's just the perfect choice. And I'm such a huge fan that they've cast Marley Shelton in this. Marley Shelton is one of these actresses that is constantly solid, does great work in everything she's in, from Planet Terror to her TV series that she was on. Like she, She's solace. She does a lot of things that are really, really good, but she's always under the radar, and she needs to work more. So for me, I'm happy she got cast in this. Maybe it'll give her some more exposure and some more work, because Marley just, is, just kills it every time, and I love that they brought Naomi Harris on. Uh, I saw her. I was watching Skyfall again randomly the other day. Reintroduced to her all over again. She's just such a powerful actress, and does these American accents that are believable, you know? Watch her in Southpaw. She's believable. You watch her in Skyfall. You watch her in Moonlight. She's just amazing at the work she does. So to me, this is actually a really powerful, strong cast in something like a video game movie, you know, or an arcade video game movie. So I'm looking forward to see what they do with this. Yeah, I'm going to buy it as well. Marley Shelton, I'm not too familiar with her. I saw her in Planet Terror yeah. and, and uh, Death Proof. Yeah. So shows, whenever I see her, it kind of look, looks like a younger Heather Heather Graham mm -hmm. to me. Um, oh, and and Joe Manganiello, yeah, maybe maybe we don't know. Like maybe he suddenly had a, a free block of time now that he can shoot <laughs> shoot Rampage, as we don't know exactly what's going on <laughs> with uh, Batman. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I hope they go tongue in cheek with this film. That's I think the only way this this can be successful. I am yeah. sad that they changed it from uh, a lizard from the the, the video game oh, to a crocodile <laughs> that they're gonna make big. Uh, Perry, what do you think? Bye. I love this game. I just went to one of those, you know, like the half arcade, half bar kind of oh, yeah. place. Barcade. Bar yeah. Not barcade. Bar it was a different okay. one. I, and I can't remember what it was called. I think I was standing at the Rampage machine for a <laughs> solid half hour. It was it was jumping back and forth between actually not back and forth because then I couldn't have beaten Ninja Turtles. because I had to beat Ninja Turtles. <laughs> then I played some Rampage. But this this is the package I would want for a Rampage movie. And. You know, I kind of liked San Andreas for what it was. I had fun with it. So if you take that collaboration and bring it over here, especially with the ideas that he's expressing, I think they could be on the right track. The only thing in the quote that had me a little confused, I can't <coughs> really decide what to pull from this, if it's encouraging or not, is at one point he says, he's, he's like, he's a... Uh, giving his reaction to if he was offered another video game. He goes, if they called me tomorrow to do Call of Duty, I wouldn't want to play any of the Call of Duty games. I'd have to come up with something that deserves to be its own thing. And mm. on one side, it's like, oh, maybe that's the way to make a good video game adaptation where you're focusing more on making it its own thing on the big screen. But mm. on the other hand, then what's the point in adapting a video game at all if you don't, recreate the story and recreate the play experience to a degree because uh, Rampage is such a classic and you know obviously I don't want to sit there for two hours and, and watch that exact motion happen right. and, and slamming buildings and stuff <laughs> but it, I, I want that feeling to a degree so I hope he still manages to capture that and uh, Marley Shelton I have a weird obsession with the movie Sugar and Spice oh yeah <laughs> where, where they the where cheerleading they movie yeah. James Marsden right. was in that right yeah. that, that was like one of the, my first experiences with James Marsden yeah. and oh my god I love him in that movie <laughs> Mark oh, it's a huge buy for me Dennis I mean you look at something like San Andreas that's the perfect audition tape if you wanted to make a Rampage movie because you can see that as a studio and say okay I like what you did with San Andreas let's take 
take out some of that family emotional crap and throw in a wolf, a crocodile, and a gorilla. That's your movie right there. This is going to be fantastic. It comes out April 20th of next year, which is the perfect release date. We're ramping up to dumb fun in the summer. You're just going to shove a lot of popcorn in your face. And to Perry's point, I think it, it's not necessary for the director to necessarily have a huge love of the property, but you're going to need somebody on that set that is like, oh, we need to do this like mm -hmm. the original game. So if we can hire Fred Savage's little brother from the movie The Wizard, who knows everything about <laughs> 80s video games, he can kind of be the tech guy on set to make sure that we're getting the rampage that we wanted as kids. All right, what's next? STX Entertainment has released a new trailer for The Circle. Based on the novel of the same name by Dave Eggers, the film stars Emma Watson as a young woman who joins a social media company run by a charismatic figure played by Tom Hanks who encourages his employees to live their lives with complete transparency. The film opens on April 28th and also stars John Boyega, Karen Gillan, Patton Oswalt, and Bill Paxton. Perry, buy or sell the new trailer for The Circle big buy. I love this book so much mm. and they're doing a pretty damn good job so far of capturing what I pictured while reading the book. One of the cool things in it is that, you know, her character spends a lot of time at her workstation in the office and that's a big it, it is a big plot point to to us in, in a sense, but it's just fun seeing that physically there in front of her and being able to see what it really looks like or what this uh, what the director intends it to look like so that that was a nice way to start and I, I just like the switch and focus of this trailer you know this is how you market a movie you you approach the story from from one way in the first trailer and then you give people a new sense the next time and that's how you start building and start bringing people into the story without giving too much away and this is just such a perfect thing to be getting a release right now just in terms of you know the surface value stuff that anyone can pick up. Oh, like, I, I've got webcams. I mean, I, all of us here are obsessed with our pets, and half of us have those little cameras in our apartments. That's not too dissimilar mm. from those little cameras that we see in this trailer. And then just the, the constant social media and the need for likes and approval on social media, that plays a factor here. And politics. This movie is going to raise some interesting questions about people's uh, political agendas and how they conduct themselves, and that's going to spark some really interesting conversations right now. So, huge buy. I love how this is looking so far. Yeah. Mark, do you yeah. mind this? Oh, yeah, it's a big buy for me. For what Perry said, too, is that the first trailer got me, and the second trailer, the goal of the second trailer is to show us more without giving away anything. That's what I feel like this thing accomplished, is that I don't know too much about this movie going mm -hmm. in. All I really know at this point is that it feels like a great episode of Black Mirror, which is an awesome <laughs> show, and it's one of those trailers, at least, that makes me feel like, oh, no, this could be happening to us sooner rather than later. We all have these fears about what our technology is going to end up doing to us. I know I'm going to be the NSA's Christmas party joke every year. I just know with the stuff I put on my phone and my computer, they're <laughs> laughing at me right now. You're going to get some of that stuff in the circle, but you're also going to get a creepy vibe from Tom Hanks, Emma Watson, John Boyega. This cast is great. Happy to see Patton Oswalt in this movie, too. I think it's going to be a surprise this year. Yeah, I'm going to buy it as well. It kind of reminds me of, uh, it was in the 90s or late, no, early 2000s. They had that movie Antitrust. Oh, yeah. Ryan Philippe mm -hmm. and Tim Robbins kind of has that vibe to it. James Ponsold, uh, he did End of Tour, which I thought was one of the best mm -hmm. movies. It wasn't last year. It was, I think, two years ago yeah. mm -hmm. of that year that no nobody saw. Uh, so I'm looking forward. I like this trailer a lot more than the first one just because they give more into the story. And then John Boyega again. You see, now he's going to be in uh, Pacific Rim Uprising. He's in this film. Obviously, he's in Star Wars, so he's starting to, to blow up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like I like it. I'm totally on board. This is the first trailer I've seen of it. So for me, I, I didn't see the initial trailer. So to me, I was totally... I love that Tom Hanks embraces this role. It's kind of villainous, which is great for Tom to play. It's, it seems to fit right into his style because he's real, like, personable. But you don't know what his agenda is, right? And he has his right-hand man sitting down with him. And you have Patton out there, which is great, of course, coming off of the, the, the unfortunate death of his wife. You, we're just happy to see him on screen doing something and doing this work. And then... Emma Watts, once again, she is kind of building this very strong foundation of a career. Obviously, outside uh, acting, hair, she's hair. doing great stuff with humanitarian work. But but now she's picking these projects that are more intelligent. They're, she's not going after these kind of smaller. She's not going after these like kind of bigger projects. To make. Like she's got Beauty and the Beast coming, but these other. She always buoys it with these other independent projects, and this feels kind of very independent. And it works for the technology that's going on now, right? What Perry was mentioning, this idea of how much access do we want. 
of other people's lives. And it seems like from the trailer that she agrees to be monitored and watched. And you see uh, Nick Stahl. Oh, no, is that, is, who's the actor that plays? Is it Dane DeHaan who plays? No, it's not Dane oh, um, Who plays like her boyfriend in the, in the trailer. He like is like, do you think this is real? And then this whole question comes in like, well, do you change the way you act because you're on camera? And this, uh, you know, we see with the Kardashians, we see this happening with Survivor, with all these different shows that go deeper and deeper and deeper. And hell, you could even make an argument that our president has this is going on now in his own reality show. This whole thing is just interesting to explore. And it seems like this film uh, is going to put the right amount of detail and attention and complexity to this it's issue. It's weird, right? It feels like we're on camera right now. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one who plays her boyfriend is from Boyhood. Oh, uh, yes. L.R. Coltrane. Yes. And Karen Gillan has a good Karen role Gillen. in this, too. Yes, uh, yes. I'm hyped to see her in that role. And Glenn Headley apparently plays her, uh, uh, her mom, oh, you right. know, in this whole MS thing. So it's just, it's just I, I'm looking forward to this. It looks great. All right, what's the last buy or sell? Okay, our last buy or sell. After a series of cinematic black and white stills were teased by James Mangold for his upcoming Wolverine sequel, Logan, the first trailer revealed that the movie would in fact be presented in the more conventional color format. However, a new clip from the movie suggests that some portions of the film might be in black and white, perhaps acting as flashback sequences for Hugh Jackman's title character. The clip finds Logan moonlighting as a limo driver for prom kids, party goers, and grieving funeral patrons. Logan will be the first movie in the spin-off series to be rated R and is set for release on March 3rd. Mark, buy or sell the new clip from Logan. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and buy this one, Natasha. I guess these black and white clips, they might end up being flashbacks of some sort, which is interesting. They used his name, his origin name in the comic book, so they're getting deep into the Logan mythology with this. I love everything about this clip. I, let's have this movie already. <laughs> Rogan. Yeah, agreed. Let's have this movie already. I went to see John Wick 2 last night and that Logan trailer right, played right before, and I'm like, can that just start right after John Wick 2 is done? <laughs> Because I'm so obsessed with Logan. And so this tri if this clip doesn't even show up in the movie, I'm happy. This is good promotional material. This gets you into the vibe of what's going on. Plus, it's over this. It's a voicemail over these images of him being a limo driver, right? Yeah. Wolverine's a limo driver. How would he be? Who, how, who doesn't know what Wolverine looks like? How is he a limo driver? This is interesting to me how they're going to play <laughs> that out. It's tough. You get angry at your passengers and your claws come out yeah, right. <laughs> you know what through I'm the windshield. Stop sticking your head out the top. You know, those kinds of things. So uh, to me, I think this is a great way to keep pushing the vibe of what they're going for this old this is this a, this is a future film these are flashbacks old man logan stuff like it just keeps for those of us who love this storyline and love the character this is a, another example of the of the uh, promotional campaign fleshing this out even more and getting us even more excited like you said it's, this movie just come out already parent yeah, you don't even have to ask me. This is a huge <laughs> freaking buy. This is another movie that is just crushing it in the marketing department. I mean, the trailer, I've yeah. seen it in theaters on the big screen, and it plays even better than when you're watching yeah. it on your computer. And just driving, I mean, driving, mm. those, uh, the, the banners and the billboards, they're really eye-catching. And it's yeah. like you could be miles down the road and just know that it's Logan's silhouette. And that's a really cool effect because like your eye catches it and as you get closer and closer, you're still looking at yeah. the same damn billboard. <laughs> that is an effective poster. And this, this has me looking forward to this too. I just really want to see an X-Men movie that has, you know, some style, some a unique style from its director. And I, what could say it more than this clip? Yeah. I have never seen anything like this before in an X-Men movie. And obviously, can't judge, don't know how it fits into the full feature. But in terms of a teaser clip, yeah, this piques my interest. Yeah, I'm going to buy it as well. I mean, some of us are going to see this movie, I think, next Thursday. Thursday. <sighs> next Thursday. It's one of my most anticipated films of the year. A rated R Wolverine movie. That's like originally I remember when uh, Aronofsky was attached to the Wolverine franchise. I thought maybe they would do a rated R film mm. with him. But now we're finally going to get it. And yeah, I like this clip as well. Just showing like here's Wolverine, this super powerful guy reduced to doing, you know, moonlining as a limo <laughs> driver to, you know, I guess make ends meet. Um, all right, guys, uh, before we uh, move on to Mailbag, I remind you we're going to take your live Twitter questions at the end of the show. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Also, I want to remind you that we have a bunch of things coming out today and also came out yesterday. We had Jedi Council that came out yesterday. Uh, later today, we have uh, the Schmodown with the Inner Geekdom Championship with Robert Meyer Burnett versus Hector Navarro. So here's a clip. I initially announced that Mark Andreka would be going against you for your belt. I'm taking that back, and in three weeks from now, 
you'll be defending that title against Hector Navarro in an Inner Geekdom Championship inner match. Geekdom Championship All right. match. Hector Navarro, the guy is so tiny. I might be a little seasoned, but I taste good. Robert Meyer Burnett, Tell him, give a shot at that belt, man. That's a beautiful belt. You got it right now, but it's temporary, okay? Because I'm coming for it. So that comes out at 2 p.m. today. We also, uh, Roca, you have a match yeah. coming up pretty soon. I do, huh? Is yeah. everybody ready for it? It's the title match. <laughs> what have I been clamoring about for months? To have the belt around my waist. Seven more days, Danny boy. Seven more days. Do all the talking. Use all your media. Go on Screen Junkies Live. Go on Screen Junkies Extra Special. Go on Screen Junkies <laughs> Behind the Paywall. Go on Screen Junkies Behind the Music. Go on Screen Junkies <laughs> anything you want to create. Go on Crib Screen Junkies. I Crib. don't give a crap. You can use all your media to come after me with your 5 million subscribers. But baby doll, once the bell is rung, it's you and me in the ring and no one else. And yes, you're the champ and I respect you to death. But I'm coming for that belt. You're just in the way. As I told Ellis, baby carrots, you're just a bag of bones in the way. And I got to get that belt around my waist. So let's make it happen. Seven more days, man. Seven more days. Get ready. Uh, Dennis, I love championship week. It's so <laughs> much fun. We got the Intergeekdom today, then the team championship on Tuesday, and then Roca Merle on Friday. My prediction? Pain. 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 <laughs> Duh. All right, guys, I actually <laughs> forgot to mention, we also have a new Awesome Tackler show coming out today on Go90. We actually posted the link in the show notes below. Also, we have Mailbag coming out on Saturday and Sunday. Also, Collider, the new, our new show, Collider, yeah. behind the scenes and bloopers with Perry. What, what can we expect for this episode? Oh, my. Well, there's a certain holiday coming up, so there's your tease. It was, it was <laughs> too much fun this week, so I'm not going to spoil <laughs> it any more than that. Just watch it. Okay, and then we also have The Walking Dead comes back this Sunday, three-fourths uh, of the, the panel is actually here. Check that out on Sunday. I think uh, 7.30 is when that drops. All right, now moving on to Mailbag. Natasha, what do we got? Well, first, Roka, I'm, I'm sporting you in my corner over here, the yeah. outlaw. You can't really see it, but he's there. You can you see, see the hat of the outlaw. You can that's see right. his hat. That's yes, that's, that's, that's enough to know. Right. All right, so our mailbag is from James Ido, and he writes, Hey, Collider, love your show. It makes my day every time I watch. My question is about rated G movies. Where did they go? I compare movies like The Little Mermaid and Up. The Little Mermaid got a G rating when Ursula gets impaled by a ship's bow, but Up doesn't have anything in it that I see to give it a PG rating. Rating. Has our perception of content changed in the past 20 years for family films, or does the MPAA just need to redo the whole rating system altogether? Thanks for taking my question. Well, in terms of G-rated films, I've noticed it as well. Like Even the animated films <laughs> you see coming out of Disney, the Pixar films, are, they're all PG. I think it's nowadays the, these films while you know definitely marketed towards kids and a lot and, and kids are the the main draw for for these movies now you have adults seeing these films by themselves they're not bringing kids like yeah. just like couples will go see this uh older people who, who don't have children go see this where i know like probably what 30 years ago like someone my, my parents would only take me and my sister to see these these films, but they would not go see them themselves. But if you go now to the movie theater, you will see plenty of people that are adults seeing these films. It's uh, money. Yeah. Money. Because a G movie is for kids. Yeah. A PG movie is fun for the whole family. That's kind of why it's going away. And also, there's no denying the fact that the tolerance is shifting big mm. time. I mean, parents aren't going to stop their kids. I mean, I can't speak for all parents, but most parents <laughs> I don't think are going to stop their kids from seeing certain things at this point. It's the same thing when you're talking about PG-13 versus R. I mean, there's things that you're able to rate PG-13 that maybe 10 years ago would have been R without a doubt. So I think it's just a matter of making more money and just the general population's tolerance. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to address James and tell him, are you okay with uh, his wife? Uh, spoiler alert, I mean, Up's been out for a while, so I mean, is, what happens to his wife in the first 10 minutes of the movie? And what happens to the main villain at the end of the movie? That's a PG situation, I hate to break it to you. 
that's a PG situation, so that's why it is PG. Uh, to me, and and you things change, ratings change. It's interesting that, that the MPAA can't go backwards and make these films PG and make these like they, they, once it's G back in 1979, then it's G forever. And in some PG movies, they they're pretty graphic. And it, but now those movies would be R or PG 13. So it's it, it's it, how the MPA works. That is is an interesting thing to me. I think that should be. Uh, renewed or looked at again but what you're saying with the g movies the, the most recent one was the peanuts movie and that's the it like there really hasn't been much other than nature documentaries that have come out in the theater that are g-rated and, um, and they have a lot of nudity in them there's <laughs> a, lot right, a lot of, of animal nudity. stuff to look at yeah <laughs> but i was i was doing some research on this and the boston globe says the film industry experts say studios are aggressively steering g audience to the more lucrative pg movies which is what uh perry is referencing our society has apparently grown saltier and more accepting of crude language crazy violence and even sexual references and innuendos so studios are increasingly confident that parents of young children will find a few seconds or minutes of risque scenes or language in children's films acceptable. And then, of course, money, like Perry says. So. Yeah, so I guess the G rating for Little Mermaid means they didn't really care that the priest got an erection for two seconds. They're like, nah, this is cool. We'll keep it at G. <laughs> Wait, as far as up I thought goes, we were supposed to talk about that, Dennis. Look, <laughs> up, up is a movie that definitely deserved a P. I could have gone with the first 10 minutes about being rated R because that thing, that is, there's emotional movies <sighs> and then there's throwing a terminal illness at you right off the bat. Right? Taking your heart <laughs> out putting it on the tee box and whacking it 300 yards down the fairway that movie crushes me every time i see it yep. it should be rated x <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's always interesting because it's always in context you mentioned nature films and yeah. i just watched uh, a preview for born in china which i, I oh, thought yeah. was really good it's coming out i think in april sometime it's rated g if you watch the movie there are certain sequences in it that are, are kind of terrifying yeah, yeah. you see i mean but but because it's the context of this is real life, they kind of are able to get away with it. But there's some some violence in that that I'd be a little wary of taking little children to, mm. s to see. I don't think you're ever going to see a Star Wars movie rated PG again. Even the Han yeah. Solo movie mm -hmm. is going to be a fun, you know, yeah. buddy ride. It's still going to be PG-13. That started with Revenge of the Sith. I think we're ever going back. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys, now we're moving on your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Natasha, what do we got? Rocky Drago 66 asks, with Gibson and Shyamalan making comebacks, which struggling director do you hope can make a comeback? Mm. Who's making what, Who's going to Okay, yeah, well, you, you got Mel Shyamalan Gibson has made a nice Shyamalan. comeback, and then Mel Gibson's made a nice comeback. So what other director that's on the outs mm. right now do you want to see come back into prominence? Is John McTiernan out of jail and still alive? Yeah, I think so. I think he is out of jail, and I think he's still alive. Go with John he, And I think he has another movie coming Well, God, if he could just get Die Hard back from the clutches of the guy who's <laughs> done a bunch of Underworlds or whatever that guy's done, we need you back, John McTiernan. John McClane needs you. The world needs you. Let's have one more good shot at Die Hard. Isn't Francis Ford Coppola still alive? This Can is. we not get an epic from Francis Ford Coppola? I mean, the man is still kicking. I want to see him direct another movie again. It's been so long. Uh, I would have said Ridley Scott, but then oh, he had The Martian, the Martian. which I, I really enjoyed. But he had a, a run. Of, like mm -hmm. I, I like Prometheus, but it wasn't you know to to Ridley Scott's level. Right. So, but then you know I, I really enjoyed The Martian. I think I'm rooting for poor Breck Eisner right now. You know, the the last Witch Hunter wasn't particularly well received, mm. and look what's happening, what happened to his Friday the 13th movie. And I love the crazies. I, wanna, <laughs> I, wanna, I really want him, him to make another horror movie. And you know what? For the sake of it, why don't we put David Gordon Green on the list, even though he's got yeah. some good content out there, you know, when you look at his track record. The Sitter, Your Highness. Our brand, I liked our brand is crisis, but no. not the general population. So I, maybe his big comeback and what will really change the game for him will be this Halloween movie. It's interesting Dennis brought up Ridley Scott because he's doing Alien Covenant and somebody else who was mm. supposed to be doing an Alien movie is Neil Blomkamp. And oh, like, yeah. I, he needs like, I love District 9 and I loved Elysium even more. Mm. Then I saw Chappie. Stop and, it. No. Stop it. Wait, crappy. Chappie, Don't though. listen crappy. to him. Wait a minute. You liked Elysium? Love the Lisa. Yeah. What? Yeah, you got Matt Damon. You got aliens exploding. I, th I thought it was, uh, I thought it was mediocre. <laughs> yeah. and crazy Jodie yeah. Foster with a weird accent. It, Here, yeah. do do your best Jodie Foster in Elysium, please. Let me, let me go can. into let me go into a, a deep. I don't, I don't know wait, how wait, to wait. describe let it. Let me go into a deep Spanish ghetto. Who can I find to help us? Oh, the white guy. Get out of here with that crap. That was ridiculous, Elysium. It's a dystopian future, man. Everybody's the same. I would. <laughs> I would say Tim Burton, too. When's the last time you were excited for a Tim Burton movie? He's still working, but when's the last time you were excited That's for one? Good, you know, yeah. You'd like to see him kind of come back and, and hit one out of the park once again. People, Ed Wood, I mean, there's great stuff on his resume. Yeah.
Oh, he also did the original Batman. Yes, really cool. of course. Absolutely. All right, what's next? Okay, Austin Dutch asks, what do you think about Mary Poppins starting filming today? Amazing cast. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, Wendy brought that to our attention that the film started and uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda is uh, going to play a part. I thought he was just helping out with the music. Uh, it's, a, it's a film that I know uh, Ellis over there is super excited <laughs> for, for this film. What do you think, Ellis? I don't care, Dennis. What? Is it going to make $200 care. million opening weekend? Mary Poppins <laughs> is going to do great, and it's going to be a really fun movie, and I'm <laughs> going to love it. But the fact that it started filming today, excuse me, while I, I, I book a flight to England or wherever they're shooting it so I can snap some pictures. I don't, I don't care about Mary Poppins wow. too yet. Yeah. The Revenge. Mary Poppins <laughs> too. The, the Revenge. revenge. Mary, Poppins. Mary Poppins. The New Batch. The New Batch. <laughs> I'm such a fan of I Emily Blunt, though. that movie. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Blunt's so fantastic, so I'm happy that she's taking this part on. She's never... Not good. Like that in any genre, she always knocks it out of the park. So this is a great choice for her. You have Meryl Streep, you have Ben Wishaw. It's a good cast. Colin Firth, Dick Van Dyke's coming back, hopefully with a better accent. And then you have Emily Mortimer and Lynn Manuel Miranda. So to me, it's a good cast. I'm excited that it's starting shooting. Perry. <laughs> so, yeah. you're, you're, so you're like, uh, yeah. like uh, maybe maybe I'll get more excited when I see a trailer or something that mm -hmm. really gets me into it, but I just didn't. I don't care about getting another Mary Poppins movie. Yeah. Wow! All right, uh, haters. What's just a spoonful of sugar, guys. You <laughs> right? both need just a spoonful of <laughs> sugar. <laughs> okay, Rob Trinidad asks: With La La Land having 14 nominations, Oof. under or over 40 percent, that it will at least tie with Lord of the Rings: Return of the King for 11 Oscars. Uh, what was uh, the percentage? Uh, no, over 40. or under 40 percent. Zero. Under. Under. Yeah. Definitely yeah. under. I, I like La La Land a lot. It's one of my favorite <laughs> movies of the years, but it's not going to. We're like a lot of those technical things. It's, it's just not going to get them. I would vote for it in every single category, <laughs> but my logical brain tells me to say <laughs> under 40 because it, it's so the chances are so slim. Yeah. It has a chance. I'm not going to completely say, you know, it's never going to happen, but it's unlikely. Yeah, I would say 0% that it'll win 11 Oscars. And the backlash is real. It is like a wave now against this, against La La Land. What? So, yeah, oh, yeah. It's, what are it's, you talking it's about? Oh, yeah, I'm, I could show you multiple articles, Perry, people like coming back against La La Land. And the regular people who watch films, too, like it, are pushing back against it. So Not I, that's articles what I'm reading. From, from the voting body, though. But Yeah, I, we'll, we'll take a look at that and, and see. Like, that's the stuff I'm reading. I'm seeing that now on, on these websites that are talking about how they're pushing it back against it and a little bit of backlash because there is this inherent feeling about it that it's a little bit kind of racist so there's this under undercurrent going on with the voting public and i wonder what how that will affect its chances because we've seen this happen where promising films come out people love them and then the systematically this backlash builds up and and kind of undercuts their chances so i think it's zero percent it will get 11 Oscars. i guess the backlash to the backlash to the backlash <laughs> to the initial backlash that came out when everybody loved la la land and i think la la land was great but yeah, i will also I say it. that this is such a stacked year for quality Oscar type films. Absolutely. So there's no way that one can just turn into the 85 Bears. It's not going to happen this year because there's so many technical categories it was nominated for. And other. I think it's going to do well in the musical categories. And I think it might sneak up and beat best. I think it's going to get best picture. I think yeah. it's going to yeah. edge out Moonlight. I think it's going to be one of the closest votes in history. I'd love to see the actual numbers, something I'd love to see the Oscars do. Mm -hmm. But I think La La Land might walk away with six, seven, maybe eight, but I can't see it tying The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And the other two movies were what? Ben-Hur and uh, something else. Uh, uh, oh, Cimarron. What? Cimarron won like uh, 11 Oscars, I think. That's a spice, not a movie. It was not, uh, <laughs> it was not uh, uh, spice. Gone with the Wind, right? It was not Gone with the Wind, no. No. Something else. I know Titanic won a bunch. It might have what? been Titanic. Was it Titanic? Might I think it Titanic. might be Titanic and yeah. Ben Hur. Pretty damn good movie. Jack, Rose, one of them makes it. Good movie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's do one more. Okay. I thought this one would be interesting. Kyle Miller, what oh, is your movie. least favorite frequently asked question? Ooh. Least favorite frequently asked question. I don't, I don't have a particular Titanic. one. I uh, For these live Twitter questions, I... I usually typically don't like questions that are like, name the top five, you know, in descending order of movies that have red coats in them. Or, you know what I mean? Just like, <laughs> we're doing these questions live. I don't have the time to research like all these movies that, you know. Uh, the has, Village was good. Yeah. I think there was a red coat in Schindler's List. Um, I think there's <laughs> yeah. a red coat in uh, The Patriot, probably. Some good red coat so movies the, out there. It's not a particular question, it's just more of like, those are things that need to be researched and yeah. thought thought about. What about you guys? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I just like the attention. Like, okay. like there, there literally isn't a bad question you can ask. Just, just keep asking them. Please, God, I uh, need something to do. Uh, the questions of like, hey, I'm going to come to L.A. We should hang out. Those are the questions that unsettle me. Who when was I get asking those. you that? <laughs> about okay. a few, How many? Where is the, show show me on the line of fans that <laughs> are sure. waiting around the hey, corner I don't have for a line their of chance fans. to get to ride on a horse with the outlaw? <laughs> Hey, nobody's riding on horse right now. Let's put that You want to go to Panera today? Let's just we'll, let's do we'll it. Tell if it. We'll be at Panera in 20 minutes in Burbank. No, no. I, I don't mind meeting people. It's just like, sometimes like these random tweets are like, hey, I'm coming to LA. We should hang out. I'll buy you a beer. And I'm just like, dude, that's cool. I don't know you from Look, Adam. If you win the championship next week, you got to get out there and meet the fans. You got to shake so. some hands, kiss some babies. That's how this works. Ah, well, we also babies. have meetups that the fans can Meetups are great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy with meetups. It's just that whole thing of like, just randomly let me take you out. Like, I don't know who you are, you know? <laughs> randomly let me take you out. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, literally. No, yeah. I think uh, West Side Story was the other one, right? 10 Oscars? That one won 10 Oscars, what we were talking yeah. about earlier. That was 10. We're looking for 11. Oh, well, ben yeah. Hur, it was Ben Hur, Titanic, and Return of the King were the 11. Listen, mm-hmm. no yeah. one's touching Return of the King. I'm just saying that. Yeah. My Her- least favorite question in yep. the history of all questions asked on social media, in the comment section, et cetera, <laughs> or why, et cetera. why don't you grow out your bangs? Oh, uh, there uh, it is. If I could do an evil gesture right now at the camera, I would. One, because I like my bangs, and two, because it's not easy to grow out bangs. I'm Wait, aware I have one day. They want you to grow out more bangs? They As want, in, like, no, get rid of them. Like, have oh, no bangs. No, the bangs well, She are bangs, great. she bangs. Yeah. Well, you know. It's, are- it's nice to not have them every once in a while, but the mm-hmm. process of growing out bangs might be one of the most awkward and miserable processes of a lady with bangs' life. Mm. I think for every problem. time someone asks you to grow out your bangs, you should ask them to cut their own bangs there and see go. how Ooh. hard it is. Ooh. Wow. I've been gonna, there before, I'm gonna start I've got bangs saying for that. it. It's hard. I'm going to steal that line. Thank you. My You're takeaway welcome. from this is I'm just so happy I'm a you dude. You should bring God. back yes. your bangs. so much easier to be a guy. We pee standing up. It's fantastic. <laughs> Alice it's the best. bangs would be so funny. <laughs> I've, I've rocked the bangs before. I, I rocked bangs for the first 30 years of my life. You did. <laughs> and then I was at Supercuts one day, and I was like, you know what? Let's take it the other way, see what happens. I'm going to a wedding. <laughs> Haven't looked back. Uh, Natasha, what's your answer for this question? What's your least favorite thing that's asked? Oh, um, gosh. You guys caught me off guard. I feel like there's so many good ones. Are all um, those Roka fans asking you for a meetup, too? <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet they're asking I don't have a line of fans. Hurt me. Yeah. No. Um, I think an annoying thing, because I, I work for Complex on the weekend, so a lot of people will send me like their SoundCloud links or like, hey, would you listen to my mixtape? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. That's it for today's show. I want to thank people who join us here at the table today. Perry, where can people find you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNMROF Collider Nightmares. On Wednesday, 1 p.m., we're live. Watch us again. And, of course, behind the scenes, Saturday, 2 p.m. It's a fun show. Go watch it. Roka. Yeah, you guys can always find me at the Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, see all the shows I'm hosting and co-hosting. Uh, Super Animation Game Time on Geek and Sundry at 1 p.m. every Wednesday. Uh, the Cinephiles, we just dropped a new episode today on Alien in honor of John Hurt. Uh, and, of course, every Sunday now with Walking Dead coming back with Perry and Dennis and Josh McCuga doing the Walking Dead review show. And next week, Dad, it's happening. Get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Uh, tonight I'll be at the Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena right down the road. That's Friday and Saturday. Next week I'm at the Funny Bone in St. Louis. You can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. Follow me on Twitter at MarkEllisLive and the Schmoes No Live show every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Hey, Natasha? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And you can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero, Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next week. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.